when you are embodying your own gift or what you know james hillman the um, depth psychologist called your calling when you are embodying that where you're when you're being the only thing that you can comfortably be in the world, when you're offering that unique way of being human that each of us has to the world, you kind of lose attachment to outcome. And by that, I don't mean that you stop caring. I mean that you recognize that it's irrelevant because you'll never know how many people you've reached. You'll never be able to count the difference you've made. And it is enough that you are embodying that gift, that you are performing that calling, that you're just doing what you were put here to do. Welcome to the Medicine Path Podcast. I'm your host, Brian James. This is a special episode of the podcast. It's not only episode 101 and the first official episode of 2023, it's also the first time we've had a guest host on the Medicine Path, and I'm really excited for you to hear it. A couple of months ago, New World Library was kind enough to send me a copy of Sharon Blackie's latest book, Hagitude, reclaiming the second half of life. And seeing as how my wife Debbie is now entering her second half of life, and had been looking for some support in dealing with all the things that come along with this life passage, I immediately passed the book on to her to check out. Well, it seemed to be the right book and the right teacher at just the right time. I can't remember seeing Debbie get so excited about a book or as enthusiastic about a writer and it gave me a lot of joy to hear how the book was so supportive and inspiring for her. So when I was presented with the opportunity to interview Sharon for the podcast, I thought it would be much more appropriate and interesting if Debbie could take it on rather than myself. So when I was presented with the opportunity to interview Sharon for the podcast, I thought it would be much more appropriate and interesting if Debbie could take it on rather than myself. When I asked her if she'd want to do it, she immediately said yes. I ran it by Sharon, and she was into it. And so the rest is history. In the conversation that follows, you'll hear the result of that serendipitous meeting. I'm excited about the possibility for the Medicine Path podcast to grow and evolve in new ways, and I hope that we can set up more conversations between Debbie and other women down the road. Speaking of growth and evolution... This year, I've set the intention to grow the Medicine Path Patreon site into an online community and school of soul studies. Up until now, it's simply been one of the ways that people could support the podcast. But I have a vision that it could be something much more. That it could be a private, online community where kindred spirits can come to learn and share in order to enrich and deepen their lives and in some cases, their creative or therapeutic work. I know that such a community is something I've been longing for, so I'm sure there must be a few others out there longing for the same thing. Since the start of the new year, I've been publishing short posts a few times a week that feature writing, audio, and video that are centered around soul-related topics like depth and archetypal psychology, art, creativity, imagination, mythology, dreams, and shamanism from some of my favorite teachers like Carl Jung, Thomas Moore, James Hillman, Marion Woodman, Clarissa Pincola Estes, and Sharon Blackie. Down the road, if we get enough people on board, I'd love to host live online gatherings once a month so we can meet and discuss what we've been exploring face-to-face. If you'd like to get in on it early, please visit patreon.com forward slash medicine path and join a growing community of soul brothers, sisters, aunties, and uncles. If you'd like to do some soul work with me on a one-to-one basis, you can check out my offerings and resources at medicinepath.me. Okay, that's all for now. Please sit back, 
relax, and enjoy this conversation with Sharon Blackie and Debbie Stapleton on The Medicine Path. Welcome, everyone, to the Medicine Path podcast. I'm your guest host, Debbie Stapleton, and I have the special honor to talk with Dr. Sharon Blackie today. I'm quite excited about it. I'll just read a little intro about her for folks that don't know her or her work yet. Um, Dr. Blackie is an award-winning writer and an internationally recognized teacher whose work sits at the interface of psychology, mythology, and ecology. Her highly acclaimed books, courses, lectures, and workshops are focused on the development of the mythic imagination and on the relevance of myth, fairy tales, and folk traditions to the personal, social, and environmental problems we face today. Sharon has written five books of fiction and nonfiction, including the eco-feminist bestseller, If Women Rose Rooted, and her work has been translated into multiple languages. Her writing has also appeared in several international media outlets, among them The Guardian, The Irish Times, and The Scotsman. Sharon lives on a small farm in the Cambrian Mountains of Mid Wales with her husband and her dogs. So, Welcome, Sharon. Thank you for coming on to the Medicine Path podcast to have a conversation with me today. And you're doing well. You're feeling good. <laughs> I am. Thank you. And thank you so much for getting up early. I know it's uh, we've got an eight hour time difference here. So I'm at the end of my day and you're at the beginning. But I it's know. Lovely. It's that interesting sort of time warp phenomena of being across <laughs> time zone divides. Um, but yeah, I really appreciate you uh, chatting with me today. It sounds like uh, you've already had a full day. Um, well, I was hoping today to center our conversation around, I guess, how I found you, um, your latest book, Hagitude, Reimagining the Second Half of Life. I just want to share a story that feels like um, it was kind of serendipitous how your book got into my hands. Let's just say <laughs> it arrived at the perfect time. And um yeah, my husband, who's the creator and the uh, producer of this podcast, had reached out to your team uh, about the possibility of having you on the show, because um, the Medicine Path is all about uh, the very uh, sorts of things that you uh, work with, this multi-modalities and different ways of finding uh, healing and wholeness and meaning. So and I think he had been a little bit on the lookout for um, women that were doing like really interesting work with women's stories, knowing who I am and what I'm going through. So here I am staring down my upcoming 50th birthday, <laughs> half a century. Uh, it's kind of blowing my mind and really noticing that I'm changing. I feel like my body is sort of almost like kind of breaking down or melting down, but I had a feeling that it's being shaped into some new form. And I just felt like there weren't a lot of inspiring uh, stories or, or a certain sort of attitude that I could kind of connect to, to help me sort of feel like, I don't know, hopeful or um, excited or engaged about entering that phase of life. I had a lot of, you know, foreboding. I was feeling a bit isolated and um, having it quite a difficult uh, perimenopausal transition that I'm still in the rocky seas of, let's put it that way. And yeah, your book arrived, your team sent the book, Hagitude, and here it is sitting on our kitchen table. And I grabbed it and I was like, what is this? Hagitude? <laughs> that word, I want to know what this is about. So I started reading it and I had this feeling that my soul was super hungry for the the rich sort of dense nourishment that I found in the book, which is this 
wealth of stories, ways of exactly what you said in the um, the title, like ways of reimagining this second half of life. Like in a way, I almost felt like it was a bit of a chasm to even where to begin to how to imagine it uh, at all. So then uh, my partner had reached back out to your team and said, would it be all right if perhaps my wife did the interview? Um, just because the book was just, I mean, I, I read it so fast that I had to kind of double back and read parts of it again. And I, I have a feeling I'm going to probably read it a few, several times um, because it's so, so densely packed with um, such inspiring stories. So I just have had this kind of feeling of like this instantaneous synchronicity that I found something really meaningful, really nourishing and very awakening. And then uh, very quickly, I have the opportunity to talk to the creator of the work. So <laughs> I feel like I'm having a little bit of a rock star moment with you, Sharon. But um, uh, yeah, it's it's been quite a journey and it's really exciting how this uh, book found its way to me. It's almost through this, um, like leaning into and trusting that type of phenomena as this begins to unfold that um, this is going to be a, a part of my life that is probably going to unfold in ways that I can't really plan or I didn't really expect. And some of the uh, sort of happy synchronicities may also arrive in that fashion as well. So that's <laughs> that's my story and an entry into finding my way to you. Um, yeah, so this story that I'm sharing of like my situation, my age, sort of feeling like a not a lot around me to really inspire me or to to know about the midlife. I imagine that's a common uh, story that you've heard from women, and maybe even to some extent something that you felt yourself as a bit of an impetus for the book. I was just wondering about your thoughts on all that. Yeah, it's not so much for me um, a real problem that I had because I've been working with myth for such a long time that it mm. is natural to me to look for stories, to look to stories for inspiration. Mm -hmm. But I was very much aware that other women struggle very profoundly because part of the problem that we face in the world at the moment is that, well, certainly in this part of the world, menopause is profoundly medicalized. So mm. it's presented as a medical condition with symptoms, which is ludicrous. It's a natural life transition. And, you know, we're taught that we must treat it, that we must somehow overcome it. Um, and it's portrayed in that sense in quite a negative light. And even though the conversation is starting to shift a little bit in the UK so that people are saying, no, you know, menopause ought to be something that you, that, that, uh, that you work through. It's presented in a way that requires you to hold on to what might be lost at all costs rather than to go with the natural flow and the natural rhythms and cycles and seasons of life you must hold on to youth you you know you mustn't you mustn't let anything change and i think that that is just as bad uh in its own way so haggitude was really an effort to provide a the, the possibility of reimagining this part of our lives to find inspiration in the inevitable change which is coming you know even if we try to hold it off it's going to come <laughs> because we all age and it was really an attempt to say look there are, there are many many things about this time of life that are remarkable and wonderful and why don't we focus on them and go with that aging flow rather than trying to hold on to a youth that is going to be lost to us, whether we like it or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. And it's really important what you're saying there about how the transition is, you know, in the West, it's very um, medicalized, because I think that's the beginning signs for women is that maybe some health difficulties start emerging the menstrual cycle that maybe you've been used to managing a certain way is changing. Like it's all, yeah, it's like, and like you say, this, this idea of hanging on to what seems to be slipping away or what will be lost at all costs. It, it's, oh, it's a tremendous, um, it's a very unstable and very anxious and very sort of insecure place um, 
to be in if you don't have other things to tether you like um, these stories or these reimaginings. Um, yeah, and I mean, I think like I think about that for myself personally is that I didn't really think that, that I was someone that really hung a lot of, you know, my identity or worth or value on, say, being youthfully attractive or young or that sort of thing. But it's been sort of all of those things are, I guess, they're just all I've really known. So when it starts to slip away, it's like, I think the first <laughs> instinct is try to, to hang on to it and recover it, but it can just be so disorienting if a lot of um, women around us in society are in that exercise of hanging on. It, it can be really disorienting to say, maybe place people's age, like where are they at? Like to find the models um, and, and mentors that you can talk to about the process if, if maybe they're not really going through that process, like in a way of um, like owning it or you don't know much about it. Like going through this time, there's just so much that I don't really know about it until I'm in it and it comes as a surprise. So um, yeah, I don't know if that's making sense, but with some of the um, impressions, but just this idea of like wanting to orient oneself by uh, connecting to others that are maybe uh, going through it and not being quite sure where everyone's at with it, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, uh, we. Uh, so I have a, a membership program for women who are either perimenopausal or in menopause or all the way through it to discuss exactly those things. And it is interesting how diverse people's experiences are. You know, there's no one way to do menopause because it's building on years of decades of, of individual lives that we have mm. all led up to the point where it changes. But there are some threads, I think, that we can we we are beginning to pick out during the course of that program in terms of the changes that you know for a lot of people for almost everybody it's a shock and it's partly a shock because nobody until recently has talked very much about menopause it's been one of those things that you don't talk about in public mm -hmm. that you're slightly ashamed of so nobody really knows what to expect as I say, the, the public narrative is very much about holding on to what is lost, and you can't, you just can't. Um, nobody really has talked about the, the distress that, that, you know, that you have just mentioned when all of the things that have defined you begin to slip away and you have no idea what is going to replace them. And most of all, nobody is talking about what replaces it when inevitably you lose those things. So that's really what I wanted to do because I think there are many very wonderful things that replace it. And I think we all have to have a time of grieving for what's lost, whether it be kind of youth and beauty or fertility or whatever it is that has mattered to us. And that's natural because something is dying, you know, but it's only dying so that something else can be reborn. And we're talking all the time about the dying and we're not talking about the rebirth. And so when I looked at European myth and folklore, which has been a source of profound wisdom all through my life, I began to realize that the older women in those stories had a particular power that was not really available to them earlier in their lives. And so the word hag, for example, is used for women who are not defined by their relationships or by anybody else. So a hag is not a mother or a wife or a daughter. She might be, but that's not what defines her in the stories. What defines her is who she is. And what her particular gift or power, whichever word you would like to use for it is, and that strength that she has, that way of being in the world, which is necessary, absolutely necessary to move the story on. Because the older women in all of our myths and folk tales are the ones who really are, are kind of, they're kind of pulling the strings behind the scene. They're the ones who move the story on. And there are so mm. many ways to move the story on. There are so many ways to be an older woman with a particular gift, with a particular way of being, with a particular power. And I really wanted to focus on that rather than just focusing on what is lost, because there's so much richness there and inspiration, I think, for people to look for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like focusing on what 
is lost might come like just from a perception that maybe there isn't going to be anything uh, generative in that uh, time, like what can what could grow in a post fertile <laughs> state, and that there's other ways to to um, to fertilize and and be generative. But this very mysterious sort of thing, you know, all of the older women in these folk tales, as you say, moving the story along, that they're kind of like you know the drivers or or the catalysts or the guides behind um it's almost sort of like holding the container in a way for life um that's continuing you know um you know it makes me think about uh the bones i mean the the bone imagery and the bone themes like in the latter chapter of the book it's almost like um women have to go through you know death and their own grieving of a certain way of being to kind of get down to the bones but it's it's almost like we become the the bones of society or become the bones of holding it all uh together in a way mm-hmm. i don't know what you think of that idea yeah i i would i would agree with you i think because of the lack of prominent visible elder women that we have in the culture today a lot of very much younger women are trying to step into that place of wisdom and you can see Mm. why and a lot of them are quite wise for their age but there is there absolutely unquestionably is a particular brand of wisdom that only comes with age with having put the years in with having done the apprenticeship with having gone through that remarkable physical alchemy that is menopause and so what i am interested in is is drawing attention to that so that elder women rather than going down the path which our culture would like to um put out for us which is invisibility not being inconvenient shutting up you know letting everybody else get on with the job that we actually refuse that role and that we start to look for what it is that we have to offer because there must have been a point when our ancestors got this because there are so many old stories and so many old myths that portray older women who who yeah are keeping the world going i mean if you look at one of the mo- more famous bunch uh, of old women are the fates in mm-hmm. greek mythology and they, they you know in art they were often portrayed by young men as beautiful willowy <laughs> women they weren't they were old women in all the texts and all the writings they were old women because it's only an old woman who can understand what balance looks like in the world, you know, who can see the bigger pictures, who can see the patterns because she spent a lifetime doing it. So the fates are the ones who literally weave the world into being. Mm. They are the ones who understand what's necessary to keep all of those complex parts of the picture in balance. And that's their job. And we see that in so many other different mythological Uh, systems. We see it in folk and fairy tales. We have these creatrixes. Um, You know, it's all older women. And we need to to think about that, that there was a reason why this was the province of older women, that our ancestors knew that that was a natural way of being. And I don't think it actually, you know, in in the grand scheme of human history, it's only really probably, of you know, a very few hundred years where we have lost that compared to the whole uh, kind of path of human history. And I think it would be very easy to reimagine that and to recreate it again. Mm. Yeah, I think there's something maybe just on a very instinctive or intuitive level that the soul almost wants it, like hungers for it and reaches for it. Um, I guess if you're so inclined that um, it can be really emboldening to read these stories and to think that there could be a place and and a role and a way to be. But it also strikes me as something quite um, vital, like essential even to hold these roles of, of of weaving, weaving the world and 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 guiding fate 
that only uh, old women have the fortitude to to uphold because they're actually embodying that lived experience and weaving i think it's just such a great um word and the action of weaving and it, the, the analogy of it i think is so beautiful um I, I dabble in weaving myself and and perhaps you tried it too but it makes me think of the two components of of weaving there's you know the warp the vertical threads and then the weft the horizontal ones and it sort of makes me think about um maybe one representing you know like life and the other one maybe representing um death and what you're saying about how old women are really the ones that know how to hold it all in balance so that we have to weave you know life into death that the two work together um as part of the whole uh cycle and it just makes me think about you know the modern western kind of overculture with its you know technology and its biohacks and its production line kind of model that people kind of compare themselves to with their bodies like being productive and it's just interesting because that's always like an ever growing kind of paradigm it's always generating something it's always productive it, the lights are always on the power is always on and it's very inconvenient to have reminders <laughs> that you know things could crash things could come to an end and things all things will come to an end even us and this current body so it's really inconvenient so you can see how um people that are actually embodying that like when you look at an old woman who's like tough and weathered and she's gonna be full of interesting stories that are maybe not <laughs> gonna fit into that um kind of ever productive narrative it's 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 really interesting um i'm not what do you think of all of that I would say that um, in all of our older stories, there is this cycle of birth and rebirth. Mm. And it's all about women, again. And particularly, it's all about older women. So we do actually see older women in the, in the birthing part of that, you mm. know, in the midwifing, but also in the actively giving birth, as well as the death. So we tend, I think, particularly as a consequence of the Christian tradition, I don't quite know why to think of death as some male grim reaper, you know. Mm. But in the old stories, it was seen that older women were literally midwifing uh, souls, I guess, from one phase of life into another. And so there wasn't this sense of more, more, more progress, because that's a linear idea. There was this sense of everything living and flourishing, and then beginning to fade, not in a kind of negative way, but in, in a kind of folding back in on itself, concentrated way, and then dying in order to give rebirth to something else. So there was always hope in that model. Mm. In a cyclical model, there's always something that follows death. And and women, again, older women were the ones that mediated that. And I think we have lost a lot in this culture because of that whole con that whole kind of linear concept of life. You know, you you begin, you're born, you have a middle, and then you die and you end, and that's it. And what that does is it creates a culture full of people who are afraid of death because it is an ending. And in our ancestral cultures, it wasn't seen as an ending. And I'm not talking about, you know, a particular belief in the afterlife or whatever, but it was just seen as some natural cycle of death and rebirth, just like trees um, in, you know, in the annual cycle lose their leaves and then bud again in spring and so on. So, and I think part of the problem, uh, part of the reason why we haven't learned to live properly in this culture is because we can't talk about dying mm -hmm. and you know like menopause that's another one of those conversations that we appear to be particularly poor at having and it's even more essential because it happens to all of us and i think until we can really face our own death and think about what that means to us and as I talk about it in the book, in a sense, befriend death, not in order to want to die, but to see that old death mother 
as a natural partner for us to move into the next phase of life, whatever we might conceive of that as being, until we begin to do that, I don't think we'll ever become fully adult. Because in order to become fully adult, you know, you have to recognize the realities of the situation that we're in. We're in, we're in physical bodies. We are incarnate. And they go through these cycles, they age and they die. And if we're constantly pushing against that and refusing to accept it, whether it's by refusing to let go of our penchant for youth and beauty and fertility and many other examples as well, if we refuse to let go of that, then we're just children who, you know, won't give up the toy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's um, interesting too, like thinking about coming to terms with death and grappling with it and talking about it and knowing that it's a part of the cycle it has me thinking about part of what was really rich about this book. And it seems to be like a, a huge um, theme in your work is how a lot of the women in these like folk tales and stories that you gathered, they're very much like like a product or an extension of the ecology that they live in and, and that they work with. And I'm just thinking about <clears throat> like where my partner and I live, we live on Vancouver Island. We're a bit away from the city. Uh, this Victoria, actually, where the, the raging grannies are from, some of the great um, examples of how <laughs> ways that older women can also use humor and satire to, to take on the world. Yeah, we're just, we're just away from that city, about 20 kilometers. So out where we live, it's not totally, totally wild, but it's much closer uh, to the wild. Like we're, we're right by the ocean. Um, we're watching the seasons more closely and intimately. They're a little softer out here. We don't have a full um, winter the way some places in the Northern Hemisphere do, but we do have a cold and dark time. And just sort of noticing that it's been really like um, healing and comforting and helpful to me, certainly to live so close to nature and being confronted with or being shown its grand cycle. It's always moving around me all the time. And I see the beauty and the regeneration, but I also see the stark um, and intriguing beauty in th things breaking down and composting and leaving behind the bones. And I feel like living closer to nature or having access to nature and natural processes seems to be really an important part of staying in touch with this, um, you know, this, this heritage or this wealth of, of, of powerful old women's stories. It's like we need to see like the death process happening uh, around us all the time. Because I think if you live in urbanized centers where you're a bit well, maybe in some cases quite removed um, from it. It's not to say you don't have the opportunity to grapple with those themes or access them, but something about living right in nature and this uncanny phenomena that I've been noticing, you referenced it a few times yourself in the, in the book, is that nature almost, there seems to be some phenomena where it's it's dialoguing, like things that are going on with, within me and my soul and I'm reaching toward understanding or I'm contemplating or musing on, and then something in the natural world will just sort of appear as like a callback or to just be immersed in um, the natural world and seeing the full cycle. It, uh, it seems to be really uh, helpful. Um, I wonder what you think about all of that. Yeah, I think if, you know, if you go back to ancient European philosophy and cosmology. So let's look at the ancient Greeks again. Mm. They had this concept of the world soul, the anima mundi, literally the soul of the world, which was always presented again as, as female. And, you know, uh, the, the world soul imbued everything with life. Everything was animate. Everything was imbued with, with the world soul. And so naturally, if something happens to you, you know, you are in the world soul, 
and a tree is in the world soul, and a crow is in the world soul. And if you are in some sense tuned into that, then it's, you know, in, in the context of that philosophy, it's not very surprising that there should be that dialogue because we are all part of embedded in however you would like to, you know, to picture it in the world soul. And that animacy, that way of looking at the world that our ancestors had, I think is also something that we, we need badly to regain today, to accept that the world around us is, is, is full of life, is full of soul. And the interesting thing about all of the women, uh, and it's not just old women, it's true for younger women, particularly, I would say, in British and Irish mythology and a few other European mythologies, is that they're presented, their experience is presented as deeply embodied. Mm -hmm. You know, even though they may be divine, they may be what we think of as goddesses, they are nevertheless imminent in the land. And so women represent the land. They are the land, but they're not just the land. They're the land imbued with the anima mundi or entangled with the other world. So women are always presented as having this association with the physical in a way that is in a way that enables them to understand what balance looks like you know what it looks like to live in balance and harmony with the, with the natural world and to understand the cycles of life and death and the seasons and this again is a way of looking at the world that i think we really really need to to recover mm -hmm. yeah it's so yeah i just think about you know again back to that whole like paradigm of this, you know, advanced technological sort of linear, always the lights on, uh, ever producing culture. It's like the word that for the natural world usually is resource. Oh, it's just resources and can just chop it up into bits as a, and repackage it as um, whatever we want it to be, energy or inventions. But to think of it as an extension of ourselves, uh, the natural world, you know, being a part of the the world soul, uh, animate, having an animistic way of engaging with it and, and, and recognizing ourselves in it, really, I think would shift, could potentially shift so much in the in what we think is worth protecting. Um, if you see the world that way, like, how how could it just be reduced to these pieces and resources and something just to be conquered and um, uh, overcome? It's like it just feels to me that if we if if we were to lose it, we would lose ourselves. We'd lose our very life. And I hope that um, a, more awakening can 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 occur around this. But it's like how how to get <laughs> to ignite the imagination so that people can 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 see that phenomena in in nature and and start to come around to like this is worth uh protecting this is this is this is us this is essential i mean this way of being it goes all the way back to so many root indigenous cultures it's like your identity is interwoven with um the place and that the yeah. magic is there too like the elementally, the different um, sort of magic or power or inspiration for transformation or life processes tied to the particular mixture of things in certain environments. Yeah, it's curious what you think of all of that. It's a lot of ideas. Yeah, I think uh, to me, the, the way, one of the main ways in which we uh, reinvigorate um, bring back to life that way of looking at the world is by painting vivid pictures and telling vivid stories so that mm. people can can better see it, can better understand it. I mean, in many cultures, we have this concept of a kind of web. Well, it's not really a web because a web is two-dimensional and what we're looking at is three-dimensional. It's kind of a, a meshwork, if you like, of, of, of individual nodes of life and being. And, you know, it's quite natural that if one of those is is a light and vibrating, 
and pulsating, then it's going to have an impact on all of the other nodes. They're going to be pulling, you know, they're going to be pulled in a particular direction, or there are going to be vibrations that kind of travel down if we look at a kind of musical analogy. So I think if we can help people actually picture what we're talking about, and if we can tell them some of the old stories that try to explain why all of this matters, then we can very, very slowly begin to to make that change. I think, you know, whenever I've spoken to even the most skeptical people, and I was one of them once upon a time, because I have a very scientific background back in the mm. day, nevertheless, almost everybody has had at least one and probably several examples of what Jung in the life of what Jung would have called synchronicities, you know, where things have just happened at the right time, the chances, the probabilities of which in a statistical sense are, are just, you know, out of this world. And when you try to explain it to them, when you try to paint the picture, they can kind of see, oh, yeah, 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 that happened to me as well. Um, and I think everybody has some experience of it, no matter how small. We all know, I think we all have a kind of instinct that that is the way the world is. And it really is a question of breaking down that overarching cultural mythology that tells us that we, we must see the world as inanimate, that we must always be looking for rationalistic, intellectualized, scientistic models of being. And, you know, that's just a story that the culture tells itself, that the culture tells us. It's just one story. We've just been taught to believe it's the only story. And so what you need to do to challenge that is to present alternative stories that are very, very much richer and very, very much more um, the kind of stories that you would want to live inside rather than the one that is clearly going to hell in a handbasket all around us in the West right now. Mm, yeah, absolutely. I'm thinking back to um, my younger years, <laughs> being an angry, angry young woman, you know, I'm of that Gen X generation, we listened to a lot of punk when we were kids and, um, you know, coming of age at a time with this genre of women's music, you know, Riot Girl, as it was called, it was a lot of women screaming gutturally and powerfully about um, things that were really important to us. And, um, you know, PJ Harvey, you who Harks from Wales, where you're living, is one of those phenomenal artists, and it's so fun to watch uh, her age and her music, you know, uh, continue to evolve. But I'm thinking about, you know, activism. When I was younger, I was so angry at everything. <laughs> I was so mad at the way everybody seemed to be like messing up the world, and why don't people see? And you just want to like. Oh, like I remember just being so oriented toward like wanting to argue and change people's mind and turn them around and how exhausting <laughs> that was and how hollow I started to just sort of feel because it just seemed like things were marching on and no one was ever going to you know be convinced. I was always in this very kind of judgmental uh, stance. Um, you know, I tried it out and uh, it... <laughs> It had its time. But when I think about these things you're talking about here and these these rich stories, wanting to to share these stories and stories that we would we would want to live inside of, to me it just res it really hits me as like this could actually be a very rich and embodied and generative form of um eco activism where it's more focused on let's let's have an embodied sense of what it is that we cherish. Let's have all of this living inside us. And I just sort of feel like that is just going to come bubbling out and have its particular effect. And to kind of, I don't know if it's part of Hegetude, you know, this idea just to have the, you know, I don't know, the nerve or the strength or the trust or the faith that if you just – if you really live this, if you really embody this and 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 you sit back on it and and this is truly who you are down to the bone, um, that that could have a phenomena of, I don't know, just like radiating out and having something kind of coming out of you like concentrically and 
going out into the world and just trust that that's going to have an impact where it lands and genuine uh, conversations and opportunity and synchronicity, like trying to find a way to um, affect change, but also um, uh, really work on uh, marinating and, and, and composting and have a rich, fertile phenomena of change within oneself to model in the world, I suppose, is what I'm trying to say. I, mm. I wonder what you think about those ideas of activism and shifting into different modes of it. I think activism, activism is a word I don't like because yeah. it tends to have been hijacked by the people that are out marching and doing very um, kind of out their political things. And there is yeah. a need for that for sure. But there are multiple modes of resistance available to us. Mm -hmm. Writing is an act of resistance. Mm -hmm. I don't actually like visibility. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd happily sit in a darkened room and just write books. And I will reach a lot of people through my books. I have reached a lot of people through my books through sitting, you know, at a computer, not really being visible at all. And then it being published and then, you know, the book goes out there and it has a complete life of its own. And then you go back again and write another one. So I think there are many, many ways of resisting. And they are based on the individual gifts that each of us has. I am not a marcher. I'm not a, you know, a speechifier. Um, I'm not someone for screaming in the streets. It's just not my way of being in the world. Mm -hmm. And yet that doesn't mean that I can't have an impact on it. And I think it's really important that we begin to respect all the different ways in which people can put their gift out there, their particular unique way of being in the world out there, mm -hmm. and make a difference. And I think it's also very important in precisely that context not to count. You know, for many, many years when, when I was angry too and wanted to make a difference in my own quiet way, um, as a psychologist who was really working uh, very profoundly with individual transformations, you know, and I would think to myself, how many people do I have to save? And that was completely, you know, as an older woman, that was completely the wrong way of looking at it because mm. it wasn't about numbers. When you are embodying your own gift or what, you know, James Hillman, the um, depth psychologist called your calling, when you are embodying that, where you're, when you're being the only thing that you can comfortably be in the world, when you're offering that unique way of being human that each of us has to the world, you kind of lose attachment to outcome. And by that, I don't mean that you stop caring. I mean that you recognize that it's irrelevant because you'll never know how many people you've reached. You'll never be able to count the difference you've made. And it is enough that you are embodying that gift, that you are performing that calling, that you're just doing what you were put here to do. And so to me, that's activism. Being who we are at the core of us, representing a unique way of being human in a very, very challenged world is activism enough for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. I like that very much. Um, yeah, this... I'm also thinking about, um, you know, it's almost like going into this phase of life, you know, mid midlife now into, I guess, what we could call maybe the this waning moon uh, phase where, you know, the light is kind of winnowing down, but getting very concentrated and darkness and death and the inevitability of it is you know is looming and reckoning with it it's also this idea of um with the calling legacy like this idea like you're saying like not really counting or taking numbers or being overly attached to any outcome but just expressing and living uh, your gifts and following your calling part of that is like noticing like time it's like there could be a time that a certain time a wealth of time that we take for granted in a youthful perception but when you start to realize like oh my time is is limited i might not have much time does that how does that impact what it is that we're we're, we're doing or how we feel about what we're doing it's like for me it's almost like it's not even like a, it's a bit of a sense of urgency that 
you know, I really want to get down to business of being authentic and truly offering like what it is I'm here to offer, but also making your peace with the fact that you may leave behind things that um, will endure and have an impact beyond this particular body's lifespan, like making peace with the fact that you're not really going to be around even to see like all of the ways that the, the lives you've touched, the things that you've been in uh, contact with and have unflowered, it's, uh, it's, it's a real trip, like to grapple with that. It's like, wow, there's going to be a point where I'm, I'm not here, I'll be gone. And calling, I mean, for me, it just feels like it, it's participating in, in, in legacy and having that sense of things, like a kind of surrender that sort of balances or recalibrates um, ego in a way, like I'm, I, I'm, I'm handing it over, I'm dissolving, I'm surrendering, I'm still here and vital, but knowing that you're moving toward that time where, um, yeah, it's it, like really, really reckoning with that. It's, it's really uh, potent and, and, and quite profound. Um, I wonder what you think of this. Yeah, I, I would say that one of the other key things that that so many elder women who have passed through medical menopause and come out the other side in my in my circle, in my membership circle, would agree is that in whatever way it happens to present itself, menopause focuses you remarkably. And, you know, I wrote about it in Haggitude as a as a process of alchemy in which mm everything that is not essential is stripped away. And that's not a one-off thing that happens as you go into menopause and then stops. I think that is something that continues actually all the way into elderhood, where what it is, is is that you just, you begin to ask yourself questions like, you know, what, what do I need? What, what do I really want to do? What gives me joy? What what makes my heart sing um, and to focus on that and what burns away in menopause if you allow the process to happen is that desperate sense of having to please everybody that we have when we're younger and fertile and want to be beautiful and loved and liked and all of those things <laughs> and focus I think is the answer to a lot of what you were just saying there that it's not so much a sense of urgency which to me always has an implication of panic you know it's like what well, i haven't got time to do all the things i want to it's more a kind of okay i haven't got very much time i've got limited time what really matters what really matters that i can bring to this world at this time that'll serve the world but that will also serve my own soul growth growth because i think that's important too and i think that is part of that alchemy of menopause again if we allow ourselves to to pass through it um, and to go through the discomfort of it, because it is discomforting in very, very many ways, physical and psychological. That is what happens. And it's a shared experience of women. I, you know, I'm 61, but I'm working with women who are 70 and 80. And that is their experience that this focusing in carries on throughout the years so that you, you don't waste energy worrying about all of the things that you can't do. But you just actually slowly and and in a very steady kind of a way begin to focus in on on what it is that you must do. Mm, yeah, focusing, concentrating makes me think of like the alchemical process where where fire is you know this tempering and transforming and this kind of refining process that we go through with fire. I love this idea that we could reimagine, you know, the hot flash as that process of embodying the fire and the heat and, and offer everything, everything to the fire that is not essential and allow, um, you know, the dross and the old ideas and even the former <laughs> identity perhaps to start to kind of burn away. Um, you know, maybe it could be generative to think of it that way when you're in the, the, the throws of the hot flash remember like oh i'm going through this alchemical fire this 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 tempering and um so really love the idea of like taking components of um the physical symptoms of menopause them 
being ways to, uh, if you could think about them kind of like poetically, not just medically, like, but infuse the, the medical phenomena that we're going through with some poetic purpose, like, you know, the fire of refining and burning away what's not essential to focus us. And, um, but even thinking about like, like blood, like in, you know, um, say like the, the older traditions, like say astrology, like the, the world that I work in, like a fire was connected to, to blood and the vital force. And I, can't remember if it was in your book or where I read it, but there was a a certain tradition that talked about when you stop bleeding, it's because you're keeping your blood inside of you for yourself. It's like you're keeping your vital heat and blood um, in you for you, for your own sort of um, self-containing, self-perpetuating, your own sort of um, generative, creative energy. And I love that a lot too. Like this idea, like, oh, you know, we're always like giving ourselves away, you know, blood from a stone, pleasing everyone. But it's like when the the blood stops flowing out of us, it's almost paralleling. It's like, I'm not, (laughs) I'm not going to please everybody. People are not going to feed off of me anymore without something, you know, reciprocal or balanced in these exchanges. Like, I'm keeping my blood for myself now. It's still inside of you. It's not like uh, if it stops flowing um, monthly that there there isn't some you know uh, churning and heat and creative fire going on. And I I really love that um, idea a lot. Was it, was that in your book or did I read yes, that? Somewhere it, yes, else? it was. But that's actually yeah. from a, a Native American tradition, Lakota, mm. I, I believe. Um, and what, and uh, as I understand it, as I have read it about it, the idea is that you know, yes, in in the first half of our lives, where where our creative energy is put out there, it's put out into the world, whether it be giving, uh, you know, physical birth to to new human life, or whether it be the kind of general, you know, growing, building, outward facing stuff that we do when we're younger, that we have to do to build an identity, to build a family, to build a mm-hmm. job, to build a, a set of, of relationships. But at the point of menopause, that creative fire, which is um, symbolized, if you like, by the menstrual blood, is not put out into the world anymore. And it's a kind of inward focused creativity, which doesn't mean um, solipsistic, you know, it doesn't mean self-referential. <laughs> it doesn't mm-hmm. mean that we get all tied up in the um, comfort of our own heads. But it's about the inner work of of elderhood, I suppose, which is more about meaning, which is more about spirituality, which is more about okay, what on earth is this all for, and why am I in it now? What on earth am I doing here? Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, Jung said for sure that. Those are the questions for the second half of life. And I think women, yeah, I mean, the, the, the beauty of, of being a woman, it seems to me, is that you have those physical correlates of the remarkable psychological changes. Now, men clearly, you know, they, they clearly have a psychological change as well in the second half of life. But for women, you can't ignore it. You can't just buy a Corvette or whatever the latest thing is. You know, it's just like because your body is is in meltdown mm. and it's not going to let you. So you can try to fight it, but sooner or later it will come around. And I think that there is that power in women if we recognize what is going on and are able to stick with it, with all of its discomforts, and not always, sometimes, yes, if necessary, but not always to medicate ourselves out of it, which is what the drug companies would like us to do. Mm-hmm. If we're able to sit with that profoundly uncomfortable initiatory experience and come out the other side, then we come out with that sense of of a, of a deeper meaning, of a, of a deeper purpose of of yeah of of you know we call it inward focus but it's not really interior it's just a different um it's just a different modality it's a spiritual modality rather than an outward facing building in the world focus mm-hmm. yeah absolutely that makes a lot of sense yeah and it's interesting too like all the physical uh changes and you know 
the health challenges that, you know, we face around midlife and beyond, how also not to just necessarily medicalize those, of course, you know, they at times need, we need to be helped and we need medical intervention and thank goodness for, for healthcare, modern healthcare. Um, but at the same time that there can be really instructive, um, these health crises and, and the, you know, the, the meltdown of menopause and the way that it sort of slows us down, that can be something really instructive and because you, you really can be inconvenienced, you can be really sidelined, you you get a really harsh sometimes reality about what energy you actually have to give. Like you say, you know, the menopause phenomena, you can't ignore it. Um, so I think that can also be um, hopeful as well that, you know, these health crises can help us to get rebalanced and recalibrated and, and notice what opportunities um they could be providing and, and what they could be teaching us, which mm-hmm. feels like part of that mysterious phenomena of really embodying that sense of balance. Like you, for instance, have a very powerful story, like so drawn to that last chapter when I arrived at it with its themes of of, of the bones and the old bone mother and um, your survival and coming through um, lymphoma like whoa like the courageous way that you spoke about it um it, yeah i just i just want to thank you so much for 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 sharing that because it's it's a it's it's a scary it's very scary um uh story but the the way that you shared about you know surrendering to it and 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 being curious about where it was leading and and that you wouldn't take it away if you had it to do all again. Yeah. I know we're coming up on our time and I don't want to break into a massive convo about that, but I would love to hear just a few thoughts about um, that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, just, just briefly, because it, it is a long story. Um, I would say that I, I, I went into that experience at, uh, what was I when I was diagnosed? 60, 59? I can't remember now. I'm losing track of time already. Mm -hmm. Um, I went into that experience with a very strong sense of what comes to us is a lesson that we are meant to learn from. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's my pre-existing kind of going in (laughs) attitude. And, you know, sometimes you get the lessons that you really wish you didn't have to have. But I understood that it was a lesson and I'd had a couple of big dreams beforehand, which had kind of prepared me in some way for it. And, you know, I, I think that often, again, this idea that we must fight illness and and the martial language that we use, we must beat it into submission. You mm-hmm. don't beat a teacher into submission. Mm-hmm. It's not a good strategy for life. You sit down and you say, oh, God, OK, what, you know? I don't want this, but I'm going to have it. And so how can I actually learn from it? And the fighting cancer, the fighting disease model that we are, you know, in this uber individualistic, uber heroic culture that we live in, I think is part of the problem. And I use the Rumi poem in the book, you know, this being human is a guest house. And he says, you must invite all guests in, even the ones that you think you don't want, because you never know what joys and what blessings they'll leave behind. And sometimes that can happen even with a life-threatening illness. Mm, yeah, that's beautiful. Um, we actually have that Rumi poem in our house. So I was like, yeah. I was pleased to see that in the book. It's so wonderful. Oh, well, this has been a marvelous conversation. Um <laughs> <laughs> One that I wish could go on and on forever, but there was it's lots of ways um, to connect with you and your work. So, uh, do you, do you want to um, just share with the listeners ways to connect with your um, community, your Substack, yeah. etc.? Sure. I mean, the easiest way is just to go to my main website, sharonblackie.net. Mm. And there you'll find, yeah, my, my Substack, which is my, my, um, newsletter and my writings, um, by subscription and various online courses that I've done. And of course, all the books. You could also, if you want to 
go to Hagitude.org and find out more specifically about Hagitude and the stories and the ideas behind that book if you would like. Mm, yeah, wonderful. Hagitude, what a great phrase um, <laughs> you've coined. I feel like it's a revolution. Um, I think it coined me, but... Um, it coined you, story. yeah. There's a great <laughs> story about you coming out of a dream with that word. Yeah. And it's funny, just to to lay on maybe a little bit of humor, it's, I feel like something about Hagitude is it's like heavy metal. It's have the heavy metal music genre. Oh, it's sure. like, I yeah. see Hagitude in this like heavy metal font on a t-shirt. It's like, <laughs> I want to wear it like a slogan. <laughs> I want to march out there and be an inconvenient yet artful hag. So thank you so much for this <laughs> inspiration and conversation and your wonderful work. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. I really appreciate you inviting me to talk to you. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed this conversation, please consider subscribing on your favorite podcast app, share it with a friend, and think about leaving us a review. If you're interested in joining the conversation, head over to the Medicine Path online community and School of Soul Studies at patreon.com forward slash medicine path. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face and the rains fall soft upon your fields. Until we meet again on the Medicine Path.